Hola a todos. Eh, para mí es un triple placer estar hoy aquí eh, por varias razones. Nos olvidamos muchísimo de que eh, la característica principal de los estudios de arquitectura en nuestro país es que somos arquitectos e ingenieros de construcción. Somos nosotros los que calculamos las estructuras o deberíamos de calcularlas y somos nosotros los que tenemos la responsabilidad civil por lo que pase con cualquier obra de arquitectura. Y eso no consiste en hacer un bello dibujo, un bello diseño y después artríticamente intentar meterle una estructura dentro que no se corresponda con el edificio. Alberto Campo Baeza siempre ha explicado que cualquier cuerpo la estructura nace con él y que si no se entiende eso, no se entiende qué es hacer arquitectura. O por lo menos tal y como concebimos hacer arquitectura en nuestro país, que ha llevado a índices de calidad muy alto en una gran parte de lo que hace. Hoy eh, tenemos la suerte de eh, contar con eh, dos de los partners principales, Skidmore, Owens y Merrill, que es la firma tradicional más importante que ha hecho toda la arquitectura del movimiento internacional en Estados Unidos. Gordon Bunshaft, en su momento, Bruce Graham, han sido de los partners más importantes y han marcado realmente cómo se hacen los edificios en altura a través de todo el mundo. Tenemos a Mark Sarkisian, tenemos a David, William está llegando en el avión, probablemente se incorpore al final de la reunión. Yo estoy muy agradecido hoy a alguien que vuelve a casa, y digo que vuelve a casa porque la profesora Cervera, que es catedrática de la Universidad de Alcalá, es completamente made in exam, salió de esta escuela de donde nunca se debió de ir, pero como esta escuela se empeña en no hacer eh, catedráticas a las mujeres que salen de ella, pues terminan siendo catedráticas y directoras de otras escuelas. Lo siento, pero si no lo digo, reviento. Eh, y eh, Rosa ha formado parte de una práctica muy importante, todo el proyecto de la Torre Biónica es eh, suyo, eh, junto con el profesor eh, Pios, que fueron compañeros de trabajo durante muchísimos eh, años. Y en una colaboración entre Rosa y Skidmore, Owens y Merrill nos propuso que, ya que venían a montar una exposición en el COAN, que os recomiendo que veáis, que sí los traíamos a casa. Eh, para mí, darle la bienvenida a Mark y a David hoy, eh, a William posteriormente, es realmente un grandísimo honor. Y sobre todo porque estamos contando con... Eh, un público muy específico de nuestro departamento de estructuras. Me encanta mucho ver a Jaime eh, hoy entre nosotros, ver a Jesús, ver a Juan Rey, eh, los estructuralistas importantes que tiene esta, esta escuela y que además calculan eh, las estructuras de la gente más conocida en este país. Entonces, Rosa, ¿quieres decir algunas palabras, por favor? Muchas gracias, Manuel. Es un placer estar aquí en mi casa, donde bueno, pasé tantos años y a lo largo de los tiempos también he venido tantísimas veces. ¿no? Eh, yo eh, simplemente remarcar que hace ya bastante tiempo conocimos a miembros de la firma SOM o SOM, Skidmore, Owen and Merrill, a través de congresos de rascacielos y trabajando en situaciones en altura. Y de aquel momento... Hasta la actualidad hemos tenido ocasión de compartir experiencias, ideas y actualmente incluso práctica. Eh, estamos pasando del rascacielos a una cosa muy terrenal, que es una bóveda tabicada que hemos realizado en la exposición que actualmente está en el Colegio Oficial de Arquitectos de Madrid, en el COAM, y que ayer se inauguró. Yo os animo a visitar eh, cómo hay posibilidades de trabajar con una gran calidad y explorar al máximo tanto las estructuras más arriesgadas, porque ellos son autores hoy por hoy de los edificios más altos del mundo, como es la Torre Burj Khalifa, hasta ahora cómo se involucran también en técnicas que han sido hispanas, muy tradicionales y que parecen más vinculadas 
a pie de tierra. ¿no? Y quiero remarcar también, que lo iréis viendo en la presentación que harán, cómo una empresa que se supone que el objetivo fundamental de estas grandes empresas, o a veces se las ha visto así, tienen el objetivo de hacer edificios de calidad, pero dentro de las características que el mercado requiere, realmente tienen una fuerte vocación de investigación. La investigación no está solo en la universidad, el mundo ahora mismo requiere investigación permanentemente y el arquitecto, vosotros que muchos de vosotros que sois jóvenes y todavía estudiantes, tenéis que verlo así. Yo creo que es un aprendizaje muy interesante ver cómo ellos llevan continuamente una fase de investigación, cómo la trasladan a un proyecto o, o se queda ahí esperando la mejor ocasión. En cualquier caso, tenéis con vosotros a Marcia Sarkisian, eh, que es un, sus galardones son muchos, es doctor honoris causa por universidades y tiene todos los premios en ingeniería, que es socio de la firma. Se unirá a nosotros porque acaba de enviar ahora mismo que ha aterrizado, lo que tarda en llegar Bill Baker, que es um, fuera de serie, es, eh, re, tiene todos los récords en, en su parte de ingeniería estructural, todo el reconocimiento mundial, y se une también con nosotros Dimitri Yeji que eh, eh, no es eh, socio, pero es eh, uno de los directores de la empresa. Entonces, para, no, para nosotros es un placer tener la oportunidad de tenerlos aquí también en la Escuela Politécnica de Madrid. Eh, muchas gracias. It's a great honor to, to be here. Thank you for, thank you for making time um, for us and, and allowing us to share some ideas with you about design. Um, I think that um, one thing I'll say is, is that um, for those students that are here, um, based on our experience and based on the opportunities that you have, um, you, you have you're in a place where where many great designers have come before you. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to get inspired and do great things. Uh, I'm a structural engineer as well as Dimitri, but we practice at SOM, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, and it is an interdisciplinary design firm. And we believe that design is an integrated practice. So what we'd like to show you today is a bit of a journey of our firm, which was founded in 1936, um, based on these principles. And there are times during the, the, the life of our firm where we need to reconsider design. And we did this at this place. This is Philip Johnson's glass house in Connecticut, in the United States. And at that time, We came up with what we call an ethos for the firm, and it's based on three principles. Simplicity, structural clarity, and sustainability. Now, these three ideas seem fairly obvious, but if you really look at the true meaning of each one of those words, it's difficult to achieve them individually, and also what we believe is most important as a group. So our practice as engineers at SOM, we'd like to summarize it, not based on projects, but based on ideas. So we were asked by Detail, it's a German firm. They publish largely information about architecture, but they occasionally publish books on engineering. And they asked us to write a book on our practice And again, instead of talking about projects, we talked about ideas. And you can see them here. From simplicity and clarity, scale and form, hierarchy and order, efficiency and economy, research in the future, and then the people that are involved with the work. So it set the stage for this book, and it set the stage for an exhibition that's currently um, on display at COAM here in Madrid. So we start 
we'll touch on these ideas. We'll start with, with simplicity and clarity, and we'll start with some examples. <clears throat> and I think one of the examples that we like to talk about is projects that you're not qualified necessarily to design. So for example, there's a solar telescope that's shown on the, on the left. That was designed by Myron Goldsmith of SOM. He had never designed a solar telescope before. In fact, we have never designed a solar telescope after. So it was a challenge in design. And the form that was created because of the function of this particular um, uh, facility is one that's memorable and is one that we refer to um, in, in, in our theories about the simplicity of an idea. The Chest at the Whip building in Chicago was very important and the reason for this was that it, it was the first that was, um, was one to invent systems, structural systems for tall buildings. In this case, a concrete building without cladding in Chicago the insertion of glass within the frame, and a tubular system where the columns were closely spaced relative to the horizontal elements. This idea led to many other ideas that we'll share with you in a moment. So tall buildings and the impact on cities, the John Hancock Center in Chicago, the Willis Building or the Sears Tower also in Chicago, were an evolution of these systems and the ideas about the clarity of structure and the understanding that people would have of, of these buildings, even if they weren't architects and engineers. Projects of different scale and location, the Hodge Terminal, the Brunswick Building in Chicago, using the similar tubular frame as Chestnut DeWitt, but creating a, a base condition that was inviting for the public, right, for people to come from the street the interaction between building and place, the transfer system that we use at the base of this building to take the tubular frame and spread it to larger, more widely spaced columns. So it's this clarity and it's this investigation of materials that we think is important at Hodge. was a Teflon, uh, Teflon coated fabric that was used to create the space, the enclosure, so to speak, of, of this place. We use similar ideas um, in, in Chicago, uh, where we use this form of, um, of structure, this cable state idea, uh, to, to hold up the roof for Baxter Travenaugh in the outside uh, suburbs of, of the city. Creating spaces that are inspirational for research, daylight, openness. This is the idea that we use for the Roche building in the United States. Clarity of span, long spans, clear space, San Francisco International Terminal, four defined columns with cantilevers in each direction toward the center, the moment diagram defined by structure. The erosion of structure, the base of buildings to create more openness. So taking a very regular, very rational, very efficient steel frame and then eroding it away uh, just at the bottom. Work with Tom Pfeiffer. This is a project that Dimitri engineered with Tom. And the idea of, of, of scale, smaller scale, but dual use of structure, shading, support for the exterior wall, support for the main structure itself, the relationship with clients, the man in the, the, the chair is the client, Tom Pfeiffer is the man on the left, and it's of a place. The client wanted to be in the garden, and so that's what the design is based on. But it's also based on this rational approach to structure. So it's a very small steel bar section, square bar section, Remind me of the size, Dimitri. 75 millimeters square, solid, that's it. So at each position, and what, what Dimitri did is he created a threaded rod at the very top so that the roof system, the connections for, 
for the, the structure above that you can see in the lower right was literally screwed down and, and connected without welding. So it's this, it's this idea about construction and connection and ease of, of, um, of, of interaction, let's say, between the, the, the final systems in order to get these things, these things built. And it's, it's of the place. Um, the garden is, was the aspiration of our client, um, and this is, the, this is the result. So structure that is working very hard, but is hard to see. So this is the Rice University art piece that was done by James Terrell and, and Tom Pfeiffer. Um, so very discreet points of support, only eight of them, very beautiful flat plane, but the structure that's working behind it um, is, is, is something that you just don't see from this perspective, but it increases with depth and reach and cantilever from each one of those positions. Um, above this, this horizontal surface. The simplicity of creating a place, in this case for music performance, uh, work with Jamie Carpenter that Dimitri uh, also worked on together. Buildings in a floodplain, so the idea of, of this, this space actually being flooded at times is part of the design. And then also with Jamie Carpenter, we call it the Tower of Hope. It's at the University of, of, of Nebraska. It's in Omaha. It's a place of healing, a place of inspiration. It's a marker for, for the campus. Scale and form. So it's a question of scale and what to do with scale. So growth is very interesting because um, there's a, there's a, I'll say, a natural formation of, of structure that goes along with scale. And whether it's a dog or it's an elephant, you could argue that the scale and the system corresponds. If the elephant or the dog grow bigger, perhaps there needs to be a change of system an evolution of system. So we wonder about these things when we define our structures and we look back in the history of the firm and the relationships. Myron Goldsmith and Mies van der Rohe. Myron worked with Mies after he graduated from IIT, but when he was a student there, Mies was his advisor. In his thesis, he investigated scale and form. And he studied bridges and buildings. What's interesting in this image is that there's a particular bridge that's very important that wasn't discovered at this point. And this was in the 1950s, and that's the cable stayed structure. That same stayed structure that I showed you earlier with Baxter Travenaugh or the Hodge Terminal, that concept in bridges had yet to be discovered. So we wonder about the scale of our projects and the building on the left, which is the house that Dimitri designed, where that vertical element is very modest and it acts to support the roof, it acts to support the exterior wall system, it's an integrated concept. And then the idea of scale on the large side and the idea of the Sears Tower and the fact that it was actually designed as a product for Sears. Sears Roebuck, um, as, as many of you may know, was a very important uh, supplier of products, actually through catalogs at first and then through retail stores later. But in the 70s when we designed this building, it was a systematic approach to prefabrication, bolted assembly, and the idea that construction could be done very quickly. Why? Because it's not just the minimal use of materials, but it's the time to build that's super important, especially with buildings at, at great scale. Uh, scale is translatable. It's translatable to the horizontal plane at Denver Union Station. And the idea that structure is something that spans across the rail yard 
the station itself, and then wraps itself around and encloses, it gives a sense of space and enclosure, um, even though there isn't a central roof. The seemingly fragile and also elevated kind of idea of, uh, of a house and a simple, a simple concept in a hillside also defines what we think is important in terms of the scale of our work. Systems over height, very important. So traditionally, one might think of tall buildings as, as structures of 15 to 20 stories, and we may use structural steel frames, concrete frames. We could use the same systems as we get taller, but they become less efficient. So the search for systems is a way to control building motion, manage gravity, lateral systems, lateral loads, do winds, seismic, and to do it efficiently and economically. So in fact, we can realize these types of projects. So we're investigating what we've done in the past, but what we see in the future, all the way through the Burj Khalifa, which is currently the tallest building in the world, which uses an idea about buttressing the core of the building. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. So this progression of material, technique, local, local expertise is all part of the mix. So whether we start with the pyramids and we, we think about skyscrapers in New York City to the Sears or Willis Tower to the Burj Khalifa, all of these are an evolution of use of material and invention of systems that make them possible. The buildings that are around Burj Khalifa in this photograph are 50 stories tall. It's an unusual moment one could argue a disruptive moment. And one of the things that we struggle with is we may have the ability to design and build these types of structures, but are they the right solution for cities? You know, what many people don't know is that there was a whole series of ideas that were developed for the Burj, including the initial scheme that was about 600 meters tall. And as you, as you look across, you find that the schemes became more and more efficient. And the reason for this was because of the geometry change of the tower and the way it interacted with the wind, the placement of the tower on the site, the final scheme, the, we call it the base moment, think of it as demand at the base of the building, was 70, only 76% of the initial scheme, even though the final design was 828 meters tall. The acceleration, what people feel, was over 40% less. We actually tested out a scheme that was much taller, never got built, but because of the way we tuned that building, we actually were able to reduce demand even further. There are no dampers in that building. It's only the, the structure itself. We think about systems, if we were to translate the system for the Sears Tower, and let's just say we expanded it, and it's almost twice as tall if you had to compare it with the Burj Khalifa. The system would have eight times the volume in order to get equal resistance as compared to the Burj, which is only two times as much, and the reason for it is because of the stance of the building. So you see this integrated idea of the tubular frame for the Willis Tower shown on the far left. The idea of scaling that system up for a building that's twice as tall, it results in eight times the volume, internal volume to do that. So instead we use this idea of the tripod, a simple concept of a central core that resists torsion and these arms that reach out in three directions to help resist overturning all the way to the building is on the arms. So that helps it um, in terms of overturning and potential tension due to winds. We have these theories that we're using to develop 
tall building design and actually structures that are much more horizontal. And we're finding that bracing systems in buildings are far more efficient if they're not concentric. So think about that. The, the Hancock building uses a concentric braced frame all the way up. But we're finding that if we change the geometry, the proportion approximately three quarters to one quarter, in a bracing system that starts to look a lot more organic, we're finding that there's a significant reduction in material. So if we think about these brace systems in the future for tall buildings, they might look like the building on the right, where straight lines still, because the load paths are still from point to point, so not curved, not curved uh, out of plane members, but straight members, but organized in a way that are denser at the bottom and less dense at the top that respond to demand. And they look, just they look much more organic, but the engineering and the mathematics behind it support the fact that they're more efficient. So Mark has spoken about the importance of um, simplicity and clarity, and then scale in form, and how those ideas permeate much of our work. I'd like to talk about uh, what I think is an equally important idea that helps us organize our designs, uh, and that's the idea of hierarchy and order. Um, I think all of our best seminal work has a clear sense of hierarchy uh, in the way the systems and structure is expressed. Um, and what I mean by hierarchy um, is, I think, the acknowledgement and realization that not every element in a building or every element in a structure are of equal importance. So for me, hierarchy is the conscious decision to decide what the most important elements are. And that's not always an easy decision. Um, in many buildings, the hierarchy of the structure is almost the same or could be the same as the load flow. So an engineer knows you have, a, you have a, a floor beam and then that floor beam transfers its load to a collector beam or a girder which in turn takes it to a column in the foundation and there's an obvious hierarchy there that follows the load flow. And in the Hancock building that's largely, uh, for the most part, that's what's being done. Um, the primary perimeter vertical columns are clearly expressed. Um, but the X bracing is arguably given the most prominent position uh, and expressed. Um, and behind this, though, are a system of systems and subsystems that are actually transferring load out to the perimeter. And so the architect and the engineers both understood this and made this a uh, prominent feature of the building to really express these primary braces and diagonals. And this was a conscious choice. The secondary members that are behind here are obviously not clearly visible. Um, it's, it's these large X braces and the nodes and the way this building meets the ground that was really the primary organizing principle of the building. Um, but that's not entirely literally true. Sometimes we consciously tell a small lie to reveal a greater truth. And on the Hancock building, um, where this diagonal meets the air there, right over the white part, that, that's, where, that's not where the force is being resolved. The force is actually being resolved with this other diagonal member that's behind the glass lower down. So arguably, from a purely structural point of view, that hidden member is more important. But to tell the story of how the building's actually working, the architect decided to raise that node up so people could actually see it, right? Because if it were down in the ground, it would be functionally maybe performing better but no one would really understand the story of the building. So this slight adjustment uh, is arguably structurally less pure, but it, it helps people better understand the building and celebrates the story that's really going on here. Um, and again, we've, we've played some games with the hierarchy here uh, between the structural purity and the architectural story uh, to help tell that story. Uh, again, hierarchy is not always related to um, load flow. Uh, in this small residential house in upstate New York, 
Arguably, the columns are more important than the slabs. They're holding up the slabs, literally. But here, we've completely reversed the scale of these. The columns are as tiny as possible to create this effect of, of the slabs almost floating. And you can imagine when the glass is on this building and it's at nighttime, the slabs will read as these horizontal planes and the columns will almost disappear magically. Uh, again, consciously uh, playing with this idea of hierarchy and creating a visual and architectural hierarchy that in this case is not necessarily exactly the same as the structural hierarchy. Um, but I think the result is still quite appropriate and, and will be stunning. Um, this is a building uh, that is a school of architecture in Clemson, North Carolina. Uh, and the building's purpose and the architectural concept to, about the building is it's supposed to be a building that teaches. There are architectural students just like you who inhabit this building every day and, and work on their projects. And when they look around the building, all of the structural elements are exposed to view so that they can look up and learn from them. And this building took the idea of the most important structural element, the column, and didn't try to minimize it or hide it or put it in a wall, but celebrated it and literally put a skylight illuminating it right above it. And so the clear hierarchy of how the load flows from the roof deck to the beams to the tree to the column structure is all really celebrated uh, in, in this structure here. And there's a clear sense of hierarchy that also matches the load flow in this case. Um, as an aside, I think this, this building uh, is quite a success because I think it shows that you can use very humble, utilitarian, practical solutions, just galvanized deck, steel plate, and columns, off-the-shelf wide flange beams, and still create a space that's very warm and organic uh, and not, uh, not as cold and utilitarian as you might expect. Uh, and this is the exterior of that same building and the students uh, who have learned a lesson from uh, working in such, such a nice space. Uh, hierarchy as an organizing principle uh, is very helpful when we have complicated uh, structures like this uh, exhibition space at the General Motors headquarters in Detroit. Uh, this, this is one of the first uh, complicated glass tension walls in the United States and even though the building is arguably complicated, uh, the structural system is very simple because of the organization of hierarchy. There's a central roof structure that holds everything up and two end posts, very simple. Those are clearly the most important elements. And then a second and third layer of cables and then ultimately glass wrap around that and are stressed against that. So this diagram here makes uh, uh, both the sequence in which it's assembled and the way it works very clear. Um, because it has a clear hierarchy. In this cathedral in uh, Oakland, California that Mark's team worked on, uh, the idea of hierarchy is not just in the structure. Uh, I think it's expressed clearly in a layering of both architecture and structural. A, little, a literal layering you see in this uh, exposed, exploded view where glue lamb wood together with tension cables and ultimately glass and cladding all work together to form this uh, beautiful uh, space. Um, this building is one of my favorites. It's right across from our office in London. And what you see here is a photo that reveals that 12 active rail lines that bring people in and out of London each day uh, go right under the structure. So this is what we call an air rights project where the developer had the rights to build in this air but there was literally no ground and so in order to take advantage of that they had to figure out a way to build a structure that spanned over the rail tracks and not only spanned but couldn't interrupt their uh, use while, while it was being built. So the solution we came up with after studying many many different systems was a tied arch um, and this was chosen because it was the most efficient use of materials. We looked at many, many different options, conventional trusses, catenary structures, varied the height of the arch up and down, and this represents the engineering solution to span that has the least amount of material. And so I think the architect 
who work with our engineers gets a lot of credit for uh, accepting this and embracing it as the organizing visual uh, motif of the building. So clearly, as an engineer, the arch and the tie are the most important elements in the hierarchy. Uh, and those are expressed as such most prominently. And then the layer behind that are the columns and the hangers. Uh, and you see all those, but they're clearly of lesser importance. These are the working drawings that um, uh, were made at the time. And I think this idea of hierarchy helps us solve a lot of problems. By knowing what the most important members are, it helps us solve uh, questions of how we detail things. So the most important members pass uninterrupted. Secondary members will pass through or stop and start. And this, this, this is expressed in the way it's actually fabricated and built. And ultimately, the way these members are reconciled and connected. Uh, this, this beautiful node expresses the hierarchy with the tie and the arch members prominent and the other members carefully layered behind it that expresses not only this idea visually but also represents the importance of the loads in the structure. Um, this is a very different building uh, in Geneva, newer, also done by our London office. And it takes, it has, it, it does, it has some similar challenges as Exchange House. It, it's not spanning over rail tracks but it's cantilevering 60 meters to create an open space that the public can walk under. Uh, and in this building, the structure is not, um, it's not literally expressed on the exterior of the building, but it's implied and reflected in the diagonalization of the cladding. So the hierarchy here is that the entire building, the most important structural element is the building because it is one giant cantilevered truss. The building is a bridge, the building is a truss. And that is expressed volumetrically in the overall form of the building. And even if you don't know exactly where the members are, I think you sense, you sense that when you see this building in this enormous, uh, amazing cantilever that almost seems to defy gravity. But then as you move to the inside of the building, uh, the diagonalization of these giant super trusses, these bridges, is revealed. And you get to experience that uh, as you make your way through the building. So structure and architecture clearly uh, working together here to create an amazing cantilevered building. And, and you can see some of that here as it's being put together. Um, this is a building in London that is we've been working on for the last seven years and it's completed now or just the final finishes are, are being completed right now. And like the JTI building I just showed in Switzerland, um, it make some simple geometric moves that create some structural uh, challenges. Namely, half the columns were removed at two places to create these notches. And these notches are to create sky gardens, outdoor communal spaces within a high-rise building to help address this issue of how people who live in a high-rise uh, actually uh, can have a a shared communal environment. So the hierarchy of the structural systems that made this possible is experienced on the inside of the building here. Uh, and it involves four gigantic post-tensioned walls that reach out from the building and then support these trusses in turn. Uh, and again, those aren't prominently shown on the outside of the building. They're implied. And you can see them when it's nighttime. But when you go inside to these apartments, which are already becoming the most popular apartments. They're, they're clearly revealed on the, on the inside of the building. And here's some of the structure behind this that makes it possible. These large walls that are post-tension and these steel trusses that hold up uh, the floors with no columns below them. Um, in, all of, in all of these buildings, we talk about hierarchy as an organizing principle and how it helps you decide what's most important. A building is very complicated. It has thousands of elements, thousands of, you know, many, many different parts. But somehow you have to distill all that down and decide what's most important. And my, our partner, Bill, who's here, has helped us with this idea of if we can name our system simply uh, with just a noun and an adjective, it helps cut through all that and identify what's most important. So um, 
a lot of different uh, people have been attributed with this quote, um, but I think uh, Mark Twain said it best when he said, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. And there's been other uh, quotes attributed to Winston Churchill and such, but you get the idea. It's more difficult sometimes to edit and come up with a simple idea than a complex one. So we aim uh, in our building systems to distill the basic idea down to an adjective and a noun. And we think if we're able to do this, um, it's some evidence that we have a good, clear idea. So the Hancock building is a braced tube, one adjective, one noun. Uh, the Sears Tower or Willis Tower is a bundled tube. Uh, and the Burj Dubai is a buttressed core. Clearly the core and the buttressing are the most important aspects. Um, I'm going to talk about the fourth concept in our book and another organizing principle of much of our work, and that's the notions of efficiency and economy. And it might seem really obvious that efficiency and economy and engineering go together. I mean, after all, all engineers learn that they pick the smallest member they possibly can to make it as economical and light as possible. I mean, so in some ways, that's just the nature of what we do. But I think in recent years, the importance of economy and efficiency is ever more important. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis in the last few decades on the, uh, in the efficiency of buildings during their lifetime and the operating efficiency of them, how much energy they use. But we know that the day the structure is built, it, it has used a tremendous amount of energy just to get those materials manufactured and on site. And sometimes it takes decades, if not longer, to recover uh, that carbon or energy or whatever we're measuring. Uh, and so it's very, it's very important to look carefully uh, at using materials uh, and energy efficiently. This building Mark referred to before, the DeWitt Chestnut Building in Chicago built in the 60s, is actually an incredibly efficient building as a use of materials. Because all of the concrete column elements are on the perimeter and it forms what we call a stiff tube, the building is incredibly stiff and it achieves that stiffness with very little concrete. And to this day, we use the volume of concrete this building uh, used per square foot or square meter of floor area as sort of a benchmark of about as good as we can get. Now, we're still trying to do better, but we rarely do as well as this. And so it's a fantastic uh, benchmark to test the efficiency of our uh, structural systems. One of the things engineers talk about is as we build tall buildings, uh, the higher you go, if there was no wind and you had a hypothetical building that was, let's say, inside a glass dome, all it had to do was hold up itself. You will get a linear increase in material the higher you go because in a 10-story building, the bottom columns have to then hold up all the columns above. So that seems very natural. You, you, you pay a small penalty. But up to after a certain point, the lateral loads or the wind loads start to control. And the forces the wind loads can put on a building, especially if it's not designed right, they can grow exponentially, okay? So the premium for height is what we refer to as the additional material you need in a tall building beyond what you'd need for this theoretical building that only had to resist gravity loads. And if we're clever, we can get this premium for height for free. So for example, a three-story building might not need to be any bigger just because there's wind load on it. It might might be controlled by gravity. And so ideally, if we design our buildings cleverly, the premium for height is very small or even non-existent. Um, and so that, and likewise, um, different geometric arrangements of our building systems can have a large impact on the efficiency. For example, a building is similar to a cantilever truss for wind loads. It doesn't have a point load at the end. It has a loads on it. But nevertheless, it's very similar. And as engineers in school, we're often taught to size members. Um, but it turns out that that's actually um, one of the less important things we do. Just the arrangement of members can make an enormous deflection, a difference in how stiff our buildings are and how efficient they are materially. So this truss on the left versus the truss on the right, uh, require, the truss on the left requires 60% more material, even if everything, every member is perfectly optimized and really emphasizes the importance of um, studying and understanding form and arrangement of members. Um, we've spent a lot of work researching this idea further, and Bill and his team in Chicago have 
I won't say invented, but they've rediscovered the work of a mathematician, Mitchell, who mathematically proves that the optimal truss geometry for a cantilever truss is something that looks like this, and we refer to it as a Mitchell truss. It's a theoretical absolute minimum amount of material for a given uh, load, and it's also the stiffest possible truss. Now, obviously, we can't build buildings that look like this, but what we've learned from looking at shapes like this is very informative, and it also gives us a benchmark. Um, we might not get that efficient, but we can measure ourselves against this as the absolute limit, uh, and it informs our design. So as Mark was saying earlier, we're finding that these non-concentric brace patterns that we call a high-waisted brace pattern are actually more efficient. Uh, and there's some resemblance to the Mitchell truss here in that we think they're slowly, slowly moving load from horizontal to vertical rather than these abrupt changes. Um, speaking more generally about efficiency and more grounded in the real world, um, once we know what the best we can achieve is, we can then test our designs. This is a building in Sweden where before we even started the real architectural and structural design, we did a whole number of parametric studies to look at varying the height of the building and varying the structural systems, the outriggers, whether we had one, two, three, and what kind they were. And we optimized those all in the same way, and then we compared the volume of material uh, and how it varies with height and showed the client that after a certain height, the premium for height started to go up greatly. And then we looked at different outrigger systems. Uh, and they didn't, we didn't pick the one that was the absolute least amount of material, because that one involved three outriggers, and those are very time consuming and expensive to build. So we came up with, with the solution that was almost as good, but had a huge advantage in terms of construction. So, so there is an art, and it's not just structural engineering and, uh, and looking at material in isolation, but holistically considering what's the most efficient solution. Um, economy. It's not just about materials, it's also about being clever. In this building we talked about before, we eliminated emollient and glazing system to save cost and material. And we also used very humble plywood walls to stabilize the building, even though it's a light glass and steel structure. So being practical and pragmatic with our choice of systems. Uh, and efficiency increasingly is not just about cost and material, it's also about carbon or energy. Um, as we all know, these are becoming very important. And so when we think of efficiency and economy that way, how much carbon we're using, we might get a very different answer. And I think if that's the measure, we might think wood floors are the solutions we should be pursuing as a, instead of concrete, even if the volume of wood is slightly higher than the volume of concrete. Uh, the use of carbon is dramatically changed. Uh, and we're looking at wood systems and hybrid wood systems to use wood where it's most advantageous and traditional concrete and steel where, where it also works best. And then finally, I'll, I'll close this section on efficiency economy with a reminder that um, you know, it's still the case that if we're thinking about economic efficiency, getting something built is often the most important thing. Um, it's often where most of the cost is. The time it takes to construct something, the burn rate every day on site is an enormous amount of interest paid by the client and an enormous amount of uh, cost spent by the contractor. And so we're very careful to make sure we have a very clear sense, at least one, of how we can build something. Like with the Diverge Dubai, it's a seemingly impossible task. We knew it was possible to pump concrete and place materials, and it wasn't built exactly like we envisioned, but making sure it's uh, constructible uh, is, is as important as these other aspects. <coughs> So what's next? Um, it's a it's kind of a daunting question. And we again look back to the inspiration that's come before us and Myron's work with, with Mies and some additional images from his thesis in the 50s. And when you look at this today, you, you, you think, well, it makes a lot of sense for a tall building to increase the density of the diagonal members in a way that's both beautiful and economical, it makes sense. Um, tighter bracing or experimentation of bracing, let's say, on the, the short ends, right? So the two, two solutions that are shown here. Um, mega frames, the idea of creating st uh, very strong 
widely spaced frame uh, in each direction, but then infilling it with a lighter uh, stiffening frame is an idea that we believe is appropriate still for tall buildings. But it comes from collaboration, and we think the, the relationship between architect and engineer is very important, and Myron was actually both an architect and an engineer, um, doing the engineering for, for Mies van der Rohe, and then later on engineering at SOM and becoming an architect at SOM, and then Fazer Khan, who's the man that was responsible for many of those systems that you saw uh, in the 70s related to John Hancock Center, Willis Tower. And the, the relationship with students and the experimentation that happens here in the studio is something that we think is, is, is very important. These buildings that were conceived, let's say, in an academic environment later went on to uh, form some of the buildings that we know today. Geometries are different, and the scaling is different, but concepts are the same. So IIT was an important place, and SOM over many years interacted with the studio there, with Myron's work and Bill Baker's work, um, under the sort of the eyes of this man, let's say, sort of figuratively, the Mies van der Rohe, who created many of the buildings at IIT, set forth this idea of minimal use of material and lightness and openness of space. So it's, a, it's an interactive and messy process in terms of research, and we find that ideas are interconnected. Tall building concepts <clears throat> relate to long span concepts. <clears throat> Idea, ideas of components in building, the buildings that control behavior are all part of this sort of research um, journey. And as we move forward in technology, um, from really things that we know to things that we don't know, um, is, is a bit risky. And it, it does take uh, engineering, it takes instinct, it takes will to create and use materials that we haven't used before. And it pushes the idea of architecture. And the idea that architecture constantly needs um, new concepts, right? And, you know, building buildings around the world that are merely changes in the geometry at the top of buildings or lighting is not what we would call great architecture. It's the soul of what we use in design that we think is important. So buildings that were efficient, it still are efficient, but maybe we can do a better job. And we start with <clears throat> the typology. It could be related to program scale, the start of a system idea, the shaping of that system idea from concepts that we've known before. As we mentioned earlier, the concentrically uh, braced system to now this more organic, high-waisted system. And then finally, it, and importantly, it's the sizing that happens after these geometries have been set. But until you get the geometries correct, the sizing becomes less and less important. So you can have the wrong system and size your elements and find that you're so inefficient that you need to go back to the beginning, the restart point. So the geometry that Dimitri talked about earlier and the placement of, of, of members within systems is super important. We've got a series of ideas and, and methods. Some are commercially available, some were developed in-house that help us define these systems for more efficient ways um, of, of coming up with, with ideas for these, these pro eventually these projects. But it's not black and white. And there's an exploration, and there are these tools that we use to try to help us to understand um, the, the, the way systems perform. And there's a technique called polytop that we use. It's based on density, force density, and the idea that you could take simple spans with applied loads and then create systems that respond to these these ideas. So there's an organic load path that, that gets created, and then there's a systematic approach, and then there's the application to the final building. You can do it three-dimensionally in terms of these concepts, 
And again, it's an applied load. Um, it's, a, it's a force flow that creates structure. And I'm losing, I apologize, we've lost a couple of the, 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 the small movies. So the result, though, is something in this case, which is called ground structure, is a series of bars that make up a field. Imagine a field. And it could be three-dimensional, or it could be uh, two-dimensional, but imagine a membrane that's made up of all of these elements. And there's a, a series of loads that are applied. And what you're seeing is these bars, these elements that have a certain area that's, that's applied to them, these are the bars that are required. All the ones that were in the field that weren't required have disappeared. And you start kind of here, and you wonder, how do you interpret this? How do you create a structure from something that's not buildable, right? You can't imagine that every one of these members would actually be built. You could look at it more coarsely, but still find that you have these long spans that exist within the system that could be really not efficient. We take that idea and we interpret it into members that perhaps could be built. And if you look carefully at this truss that just is a simple spanning truss from point to point, and you look at the center line and you look at each side independently, it's the tall building turned on its side. So that high-waisted brace frame that I showed you for the tall building is actually there and mirrored about that center point. So it's all inter interrelated. And in fact, the solution is very efficient. So bridges that we've been building with, let's say, a simple Pratt truss are far less efficient than the structure in the middle. The volume of material required for the same level of deflection is almost 70% more for a truss that we've been using probably for 150 years. So we, we challenge ourselves to think about these new geometries, both vertically and horizontally, to create more efficient ideas and systems. We can take it vertically, but interpret it so it's not so sterile, right? So it's not the exact mathematical solution and create structures that might look like this. So these typologies get into systems Approaches to tall buildings where bracing is really important for wind, stiffness is important for wind, but ductility is important for seismicity. So what we've done is we've discovered a way to integrate both. So imagine a building in its normal state, moderate winds, moderate seismic, remains elastic, and it's stiff. So the amount of members that we need are directly related to demand and the bracing system that you can see in, in these diagrams are ideal for that. When the big earthquake comes though, we need to come up with a way to dissipate the energy. Diagonal braces are not very good for this. They act in a, in a brittle way. So we're fusing them by these links. And we can artistically do this, okay, so we can take this this idea of, of the Mitchell truss, which is mathematically described on the left, we can stretch it to create new architecture, image all the way to the right. You can see the variation in density from the base to the top. There's a programmatic change in this building. It's office at the bottom and residential at the top. Less members in the way of views and daylight. It all makes sense. And we can also think about linking these diagonals with these fuses. Could be at the center of the building, it could be on the edge of the building, um, and, and deal with the demands of both wind and, and seismic. So we think this is a new discovery. We think that this is important for buildings where the systems are complex but beautiful. Um, the load paths are actually very straightforward and efficient. So we take this sort of big idea the idea of fusing uh, structures at times, and we think about the joints in the building, right? So imagine building joints being like the joints in your body, so that the rotation that happens is not completely unrestrained, like let's say in your shoulder. You've got muscles, you've got tendons that control the motion. Imagine that the joints do the same thing in a building, 
and we use friction. First, fixed, clamped, without motion. Wind and seismic, the normal activities of the building, building is fixed. Big earthquake comes. We dissipate the energy through rotations or sliding. And we use friction in those joints. So those curved plates are clamped together. And there's a, there's a membrane in between. That membrane could be brass. It could be a brake pad. It could be inorganic. We know what the coefficient of friction of the material is. We know what the clamping force is. So we know when it's going to slip. So we can tune a building during an earthquake and slip certain joints, right, and dissipate the energy. The building has stored energy inside of it. Not all the joints were designed to slip. Building theoretically comes back after the, after the earthquake. So, you know, these are things that, that we think about because you can, you can take this idea on the far right and actually apply it to things like wood, right? You could take wood members, put these joints in it. Wood is actually not a great material for seismicity. It's, it's, it's quite brittle. But we can use these techniques to create ductile moments, ductile hinges, so to speak, and keep the building elastic. Don't damage the structure during a big earthquake. We can take these forms, turn them on the horizontal, come up with ideas of efficiency through um, what Bill likes to call a sushi tray. And you'll see this, actually, if you make it to the exhibition. And the idea of using individual elements with different geometries, individual elements within these geometries, to create a load path that allows for things like flat panels. So glass that can be inserted uh, into the form, straight segments from point to point so it can be built. Um, and creating these ideas of sort of enclosure, but long spans, minimal structure, that's the goal. Um, it's a little, a little odd, okay, but on the second floor, this is room 260, you see this? It is 260, yeah, 260 in our Chicago office. Um, it's, it's a off, normal office building, but a few years ago, Bill said, well, you know, we, we should really create a wind tunnel. Why? Because we can study buildings uh, at the early stages. We can study geometry and form. We can look at the impact of wind. Um, and we can do comparisons um, between geometries to see what's more efficient. It's not the final design for the buildings, but um, it's an important first step. So recently we had a competition and we were studying the form of this building and also the system of this building. And the idea was to create bracing that connected to cores along the height of the building. And within this were outriggers, like we talked about before in the building in Sweden, at, at certain stages along the height of the building. And we, we created a structure, an idea, that had this organic bracing pattern at at the perimeter that was, that was used for the primary structure for wind and gravity. But it also created a structure that had very few vertical elements, and it used the same principles of the Burj Khalifa, although not as tall. And what's important here is the organization. You have a central core with the services the primary heart of the building that runs up vertically, which we surround with a closed form that has high torsion resistance. And then we have local shuttle elevators that go up vertically from point to point during um, you know, certain, certain segments of the tower. And those are on the outside of that space. So it's uninterrupted, column-free space. When the elevators drop off, we create these moments of, um, we'll call it interaction. Two-story spaces, they could be single-story spaces. So sequentially, as we move up the building, all f really all three of these uh, perimeter areas get captured. So it's a way to, s to use a structural system to rethink the use of space, hopefully organize it in a way that makes it more successful. So one of the things that we think is really important is engineering and art. And we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing with artists. 
Um, and and the, the intersection between art and, and how these things are actually designed and built. The opportunities we get to engineer art are, you know, it's a small amount of what we do, but I think uh, these projects have an importance that is quite large uh, related to their scale. I mean, you, you may probably don't know this, but SOM worked with uh, Picasso uh, to engineer this sculpture in Chicago on the left. And more recently, uh, we worked with Frank Gehry to engineer his fish sculpture in Barcelona. And that work with him actually led to SOM being the structural engineer for probably his most famous work, which is the Bilbao Museum in Spain. And I think at the time, this idea of you know, fabricating a very complex curvatured, curved steel geometry was quite, was quite bold and unusual. And, uh, but now it's, it's become commonplace. And I, I would argue that the confidence we had doing a complicated structure and successfully realizing that art piece actually helped allow something like this building to come forth. Um, more recently, we've had the pleasure to work with artists such as James Plenza, who did this, this sculpture on the left, uh, which, believe it or not, is doing some very difficult engineering things. These, these rods are incredibly long and slender, and they undergo large deflections and almost buckle. Uh, and Mark's group in San Francisco has been working with an artist, uh, Janet Eckelman, who works with uh, ropes and nets. And you can see in the form of these I'll call them cable nets, um, some of the ideas of the Mitchell Truss that require obviously advanced analysis, but at the same time these sculptures and these work with artists are very grounded in humble practicalities like tying knots uh, and, and cra a craft that you know, is probably best known by fishermen. So the bringing together of, on the one hand, you know, simple, humble, tangible practicalities and also high-end analysis is something we get to do uh, when we work with artists. And here's, here's some more of her work. Um, Mark mentioned this Hope Tower on the left. I think one of the great things about designing art is the, the barrier between structure and sculpture really breaks down. Um, a lot of engineers spend their whole career and everything they build or design gets covered up. Uh, with these pieces, especially the one on the left, every element of structure is also an element of, of, of the artist's vision and sculpture. And so we have to think really carefully about the craft and the detailing. Uh, on the right, the structure is hidden, uh, but the restraints on the form that it can take to create this very dramatic geometry are, are very, very uh, confined. Looking again in more detail at the Tower of Hope, um, the structure is repetitive. Uh, it's made of stainless steel rods um, and it's you know it's sculpture in its own right it's also very efficient uh, round tower geometry for, for a very tall and slender structure again uh, the structure making this art piece possible uh, is not what's on display but it's enabling something extraordinary to happen uh, and the analysis behind it all goes unnoticed in the final result to allow people to have this magical experience. Uh, Mark also talked about this piece. Again, these pieces of art are, are fun, I think, for an engineer because they're often, we have fewer constraints sometimes. Uh, we don't have to deal with mechanical systems and, and elevators and lifts and, and so forth. So we get to f focus on the purity of the idea and the purity of the structure. Uh, and even something as simple as a, a handrail like this handrail in New Jersey, took a tremendous amount of engineering uh, to get the details right, to get the structure light, uh, and have a beautiful functional piece of sculpture that is, that is also a protective handrail. Uh, these pieces in California on the left, th these are a series of weather vanes that uh, move and react uh, to the weather, and each is a very tall, slender pole that's intended to react and move with, with the weather. Um, on the spectrum between art and buildings, I think a museum is somewhere in the middle because often museums are freed from some of the programmatic constraints of normal buildings. This building in Potomac, Maryland that is just opening is a new museum 
uh, that's all about celebrating concrete as a sculptural material. And arguably, the museum is itself a piece of art. You walk through an experience. And the architect, Tom Pfeiffer, and SOM structural engineers, we work very hard to celebrate the craft of cast in place concrete as the primary structural material. And just like the building we're in today, the floors are terrazzo. They're meant to last for hundreds of years, but this terrazzo was developed to look like concrete. And we work to have no joints in it, so everything floats so it doesn't crack and move. <coughs> Uh, the ceiling, our cast-in-place concrete, and every, every form joint was laid out by the architect, and the entire geometry of the building responds to that basic module of builders in the field laying formwork uh, so that, you know, the craft of building uh, and the final geometry and form of the building are really one and the same. And the result is, a, is really a celebration of concrete as sculpture and as building. Uh, down to the tiniest detail here where you know, this is clearly a piece of art, I would argue, even though it's a staircase, but it's also pure structural concrete. So in closing, um, I think I'll hand it back to Mark, who can just sum up by talking a bit about the people uh, behind these ideas uh, we shared today. So, I, you know, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it simply comes down to um, interest and passion and a lot of the work that we, we, we do and what we showed is, is something that we live, and it, there, there, there's no time clock on this. There's, it, it's much like the studio work that you do uh, here at the university. It, it happens organically, and um, we, we think that um, we're, we're, we're very interested in, in not only developing it, but, but showing it, you know? So uh, a few years ago, we were, asked, as I mentioned before, to, to write the book with detail. And then as a result of that, we created a series of, of, of exhibitions that surround these ideas. And uh, this is a, a photograph from Aalborg, Den Denmark. And, and, and the, the building that this boy is, is holding is the tallest building in Aalborg. So it's, uh, it's about 15 stories tall. And you get a sense of scale relative to some of these projects that we've been talking about. But it's this type of group, this kind of idea of, of sharing is what we think is important. So as a result, this idea started very modestly before Alberg, actually in Munich. And it, it's a very tangible way, we think, we hope, to show what engineering means. Um, and, and, and how it's integrated into architecture. And there are a series of, of models that have been created. Um, they're paper models. Everything that you see there in those tall buildings is structure. There's no enclosure, there's no interior finishes. But I think you would agree that it shows every much about the architecture as it does about the engineering. And there's a look at various scales and some of the theories that perhaps haven't been built yet, but we think are super important for long span lightweight structures. And we've tried to come up with a way to illustrate the engineering through the work and, and the ideas. We've created kinematic structures. Um, first as an idea of research and then of practicality. This is in Los Angeles last summer. So this is a, a concept based on rigid origami, and this is a movable structure. So we can imagine that in time, we may have structures that transition, control daylight, control cooling, heating, but it's a free form kind of idea of, of, of sketching and many things that aren't built right away. But they're based on mathematical principles and engineering and then this, this relationship with, ultimately, with architecture and design. So we have an exhibition um, that's here in Madrid. It opened last night. 
And I'll say that it was a wonderful event because we, we had a lot of interest and a lot of people that believe that design is important. And as part of this exhibition, um, we've introduced a few new ideas. And one's related to, I'll say, a, a method of construction that's been used for hundreds of years. And it's the use of masonry in modest and even long span structures. And what you see is a vault. And the analysis that we did for the vault, and what you're seeing is, 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 is lines of, of, of high demand in red. So the point supports that you see in the plan diagram show the highest concentration of load. The blue is least concentration. And in fact, the vault that was built takes away that whole center piece because the material is not required. And why are we doing this? It's because we think that the technology of analysis that we've been able to develop first, perhaps with tall buildings and now with buildings um, of, these, of these spans, can lead to greater advancements in, in the way we build even modest types of structures. So there's a spirit behind this. and. Um, we encourage you to go out to COAM to, to take a look at this. This is the start of the vault. I won't reveal what the, what the vault looks like because you should go and see it. Um, but there's, uh, there's an energy around uh, craft and, and, and um, you, you know, sort of collaboration and, and making these things happen. So here's a plan diagram of, of the exhibition at COAM. The vault work is the first thing that you see um, for the exhibition. And then there's some research and tall building models and so forth that you'll see in that large second room. In addition to that, there's a transitional piece. It's a small piece, but it's one worth noting. And it's about machine learning. And that's something that we're looking at today as, as a new advancement. And machine learning is something that um, is being used for the automobile industry uh, as a good example. Um, but we see it as something that we can use in reading actually structures, reading them in place, construction, reading drawings, corresponding drawing to building. So take a moment if you get there and, and, and think about what perhaps this machine learning um, idea might, might lead to in terms of our, the future of our design and construction. I'll close there, although I want to introduce Bill Baker, who actually did make it. Um, Bill uh, came in from uh, Saudi Arabia, I think. Where, where did you come from? <laughs> but Bill, just, just so you know, for the students here, um, Bill is the structural engineer responsible for the Burj Khalifa. So he's also responsible for inspiring the book, um, and also the exhibition. So Bill, I just want to give you a chance to maybe say a few words. Anyway, I'm very, very pleased to, uh, that I finally made it. You know, these, you know, what did, uh, uh, what did uh, some Frank Lloyd Wright once said something about, your, you know, the most important thing is your next client, okay? And so <laughs> I had a new client, so I had to go, go take, take care of them. Uh, but it is all, all about this, and, and this exhibition is about ideas, uh, the book is about ideas. It's not about projects. Uh, the ideas may show up in projects, but it's not about projects. And so, and we're, we're trying to make all these ideas available to everyone. To, uh, uh, I remember Foz Khan used to say, uh, uh, you know, his, his goal was to uh, come up with, to uh, publish, not, not patent, uh, you know, get them up with the, with the next idea first. And, and get it out there. And so, uh, we're sharing with 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 it, with uh, with you our ideas. We hope you'll take them. We hope you'll add new ideas. Hope you'll create new architecture uh, out out of these ideas. Uh, architecture looks new, and it's different because it's more substantive. Because it, it represents something that, that that's very very important. And so that's what the, this exhibition is about. So what the book's about. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I heard it was a very nice event last night. I got some, some text messages about it. So 
I'm, I'm very pleased that it's now here in, in Madrid. And uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Mark, because I just came in the middle of this thing. And so, <laughs> OK, all right. Thank you. That's, that's really all we have for you today. And um, I don't know if there's a chance for questions. We probably run kind of long, sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I, and I, I always, I often say this. This is, um, you know, this is this is kind of a work in progress. This is, uh, this is something that, um, that we can't. There's no way we can do this alone. And, and and we we get inspired by the interactions with students and universities. Um, a lot of this work is actually a collaborative sort of effort between um, students that are really interested in the work and and us, um, the professors that also believe in this, hugely important. So thanks to all that, that support this. So that's what we have. And um, we can open it up if you'd like, or we can, we can call, call this, uh, call this, uh, the session over. I don't know. It's just, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I see a lot of work with the structure, with high, high buildings and stuff. Is there any investigation into what materials you use for an outer skin? Oh, uh, almost every time we see glass and we see a lot of, of, of glass buildings. And when we get to lower buildings, we see the use of, of, of more different outer skins or outer layers. Is there any investigation into using other kind of materials that are not glass into higher buildings? And not depend on glazing. Uh, I don't know. Question. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there's, you know, the, the skin is very, very, very important, both from the uh, uh, operations, of course, but also embodied energy. We're doing a lot of research into how to minimize the embodied carbon of your skin. You know, uh, glass and aluminum have a really high embodied uh, energy, uh, embodied carbon, and. Um, so we're actually, you know, the, if you go to the exhibition and you look at the, the clay tiles, we're actually looking a lot at masonry as a, as, a, as a way to going back. And we're also doing like research in masonry in the sense, you know, you go to, that, you go to the exhibition, you're going to see masonry that's real structure. It's not facade, it's not veneer, it's the real deal. And so uh, on, if you go back, uh, you know, in the past, masonry... Uh, you know, was the architecture and the structure, and it was real structure. And uh, in the not too distant past, it's become more of a, just a veneer, a decoration, and not a real structure. And so we're trying to do some research right now on how to bring masonry back as both, uh, you, know, you know, for its, its use as an enclosure, but also as structure. And, it's, uh, and, and uh, here it's maybe not so bad in Chicago where you have thermal problems, and you're trying to get, um, you're trying to, um, you know, you can't have masonry exposed to the weather because of the thermal problems. And, you know, how do you deal with that? So it's, uh, uh, and, it's and it's going over into our, our, our facades and, and the like, too. Uh, uh, and, you know, I just came from, like I said, Saudi Arabia, where <laughs> light's pretty important. Uh, the, uh, the exposures, you know, and a lot of the sophisticated algorithms we use for structures are easily used for, like, laying out the skin of a building. You know, the technology, the mathematics are the same. It's just a different problem. Nadie yeah. más? Pues, muchísimas gracias. Yeah, one more. I, I, I'm very appreciative of your, your presence here. 
and I think we have a lot of uh, research uh, fields uh, that uh, we can share. Uh, oh, we are uh, from, uh, I think, 50 years ago, uh, studying Mitchell structures and Mitchell forms and efficiency in forms, and so we agree with some of uh, all your results is uh, almost the same. And uh, uh, speaking about that, I think I, I had only one difference in your expression. We think that a form has uh, four components. One is topology, but the other is span or height or length after is the slenderness, global slenders, and last and the least important is the sizing, and we agree with that, yes. <laughs> but uh, I think you have uh, had a very interesting uh, presentation, a very uh, inspiring presentation, and we thank you for that. Thank you.